My dear friends, this afternoon we're going to consider a couple of the most remarkable uh, post-Reformation revivals in Scottish church history. And one of the most remarkable things about these revivals is they, they occurred, as it were, in a moment of time. One of the things it brings home to us is that that may well be a feature of the reviving work that comes from above that it will happen in a moment of time and have um, consequences so much greater than that, reverberating over the years. One of these revivals took place in 1596, and I'd be very surprised if any of you knew very much about it. Um, the other took place in 1630 and is perhaps better known. One was in the High Kirk of St Giles, in a general assembly of the Church of Scotland in 1596. Perhaps we associate general assemblies as being rather boring and turgid occasions. Well, in the 1596, it wasn't like that. In 1630, a revival took place in Kirkushots on a Monday after a communion in the church at Kirkushots. But by all means, let us be moved by the experience of the church back then, bearing in mind that Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever, and the power of the Holy Spirit is not diminished in our day, though we may believe that we see so little of his work in our churches or in our society. His power is not diminished, dear friends, to quicken, uh, and the needs of sinful human humanity are the same today as they ever were. So let us believe this, what he did then, he can do again, and he can do in our day. Praise his name. Because God is sovereign, and his grace is sovereign. That is our belief. And Christ, who has all authority in heaven and on earth, is building his church so that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Let me just mention, before we turn to the 1596 reviving, uh, the post-Reformation struggles that there were in the Reformed Church in Scotland. A right understanding, my dear friends, of the Reformation sees it as a work of the Holy Spirit. There is no other explanation for what happened in the 16th century. The Lord brought life from the dead in Europe. He raised up men as his instruments for pulling down Satan's strongholds and for building up his Zion. Calvin in Geneva, Luther in Germany... Uh, these great reformers in Netherlands as well, and John Knox in Scotland, and many, many others. The Lord brought life from the dead. The Reformation didn't touch all European countries equally or uniformly, but there was certainly a radical, thorough Reformation in Scotland. God's man north of the border, as we knew from last night, was John Knox, and it was divine deliverance from a Babylonian captivity of what was seen to be a spiritually moribund, sterile, sacerdotal, soul-destroying Roman Catholicism, which was, was, which was the case in Scotland. The gospel was heard in power in Scotland. Church order was transformed. Worship was transformed and quickened. The sacraments were liberated from superstitious accretions. But the 20 years following the Reformation in 1560 were nonetheless turbulent years for the Scottish emerging Scottish Reformed Church. Certainly the Scots Confession of 1560 uh, legislated in August 1560 that the Pope would have no jurisdiction in the Kingdom. The Parliament of 1567 recognised the Reformed Church, though the bishops retained their seats in Parliament and continued to draw their revenues most of which, however, lined the pockets, purses of one or other of the nobility. Well, in 1572, John Knox passed to his eternal rest, and with his passing, the church lost, obviously, a powerful leader. The Lord, however, had his man to take up the reins, and this was Andrew Melville, who returned from the continent in 1574, and the tide return, turned again in favour for the Reformed Church of Scotland. 1578 saw the introduction of the Second Book of Discipline, 
first book of discipline was 1560. The second book of discipline, uh, 1578, was more explicit in some respects of church order. Uh, this strongly advocated a clear-cut distinction between civil and ecclesiastical government. It set forth strongly the principles of the divine right of presbytery over against episcopacy, called in those days, by the way, um, prelacy. And this book was adopted by the General Assembly of the Kirk in 1581. But as long as James VI, who became in 1603 James I of England, James VI of Scotland was king, after he assumed uh, kingly powers in 1587. He followed his mother Mary, Queen of Scots, in uh, 1567. He was just uh, a year old or thereabouts. But when he assumed fully the king kingly powers in 1581, there would be a, from that point, because he was committed to the prelacy, to, to the to the promotion of episcopacy in Scotland, there would be an ebb and flow of forces which favoured presbytery and forces which sought to displace it. Displace it by episcopacy and by the attendant authority, it has to be said, of the king and the bishops. And it was over the bishops, King James VI had a considerable degree of authority, which was one of the reasons he favoured episcopacy. But in 1592, things seemed finally to be settled with the passing of what is often colloquially called the Golden Act, 1592. This was called the Act for Abolishing of the Acts Contraire the True Religion. And this came to be considered as the Magna Carta of the Scottish Reformed Church. It seemed decisively to settle once and for all the government and jurisdiction of the church in the nation. It would be Presbyterian. It would be governed under the assembly through synods, presbyteries and kirk sessions. But things would not be settled as long as James was on the throne, both before and after the union of the crowns in 1603. Meanwhile, those who had experienced the days of Reformation had passed away, passed from the scene, and the church and country were afflicted by a spiritual doldrums. There was, however, a bright light in the general darkness of the late 16th century, it related to an ordinary minister and to an extraordinary general assembly of the Kirk. And to visit this, we have to go to Edinburgh in 1596 and meet with a character of whom perhaps you have heard nothing, John Davidson of Preston Pans. Now, a generation had passed since the Reformation, but it was only 36 years from the glorious events of 1560, when the Reformed Church was established in the nation, arising from times of spiritual awakening. With the passage of time, meanwhile, there had been, uh, uh, there had been a, a growing carelessness in the church. There had been a growing indifference among the people. Standards had slipped. There was a feeling among some of a growing apostasy from the Reformed faith and life. The Reformation had brought life and a new enthusiasm for the great gospel truths that were rediscovered. But church life, towards the end of the century, had become rather cold, and there was an urgent need for a quickening, for an awakening, for a revival by the Holy Spirit from above. Of course, in the interim, there had been struggles, not only from outside forces antagonistic to the Reformed faith and uh, Presbyterian church government, but also from within, how often this comes from within the church. Declension comes from within, not least from ministers and elders of the kirk growing cold and becoming formal and becoming lifeless and going through the motions. And we who have been called as pastors and ministers, if we are honest with ourselves, recognize this, the struggles that we have in this way, in maintaining a, a, a ministry with enthusiasm, because there are so many things that hit us hard in the work of the ministry. And it often repeats itself in the history of the church. But there were some who were exercised about this situation, and one such was John Davidson. John Davidson had been born in Dunfermline in Fife in 1549, so he had memories 
of the exciting times as a young man when the Lord visited the land with Reformation. He had been converted as a young boy, we're told, and after graduating from St Andrews University in 1570, he had a wonderful experience of enjoying the ministry and fellowship there of John Knox in his declining years, in Knox's declining years, physically speaking. But Knox and the other reformers had made a deep impression on young John Davidson. However, the impression he made on others often produced a negative result. Very often, um, very often he, he, uh, he uh, uh, experienced exile and he experienced antagonism from others, so that, in fact, he was exiled uh, more than once uh, to England, exiled to England, Remember, there was no union of the crowns even then, far less union of the parliaments, which was 1707. He was exiled to England various times between 1574 and 1589. Entering into the ministry of the Church of Scotland, he ministered in several congregations in, in Edinburgh um, uh, uh, before being settled in a place called Preston Pans. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of Preston Pans, far less been there. But Preston Pans is a small, would have been a very small, quite a small village on the southern coast of the Firth of Forth, about 11 miles east of Edinburgh. And it was this place and parish that Davidson's name is invariably associated. Uh, he was there from 1595 until his passing in 1604. Now, John Davidson was one of those who would not go with the flow or remain silent on what he perceived to be the corruptions that were evident in the church and in the state. Whatever discomfort it meant for himself, or uh, whatever ill will might have been, uh, might have been uh, ex ex uh, experienced towards him, expressed towards him. He felt so exercised about the decline of religious, spiritual religious life that he wasn't slow to speak out in the courts of the church didn't make him popular, but it was his conviction. And his supreme conviction was that a spiritual revival was needed in the church. After all, this is the principal concern of the church. What is the church about if it isn't about the preaching of the gospel so that men and women genuinely would have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ? My dear friends, do we not feel that this is the great the great need of our day, that men and women would, come, would be confronted with this necessity of being right with God, of coming to peace with God, of being reconciled with God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, as for Davidson, he sought the guidance of his own presbytery in Linlithgow, in uh, presbytery of Haddington, rather, and the Presbytery decided that a proposal in Presbyterian terms, an overture, be made to the annual General Assembly when ministers and elders gathered from all over the church. An overture that would, uh, that would maintain uh, or, or that would speak of the gross sins of church and state and that that should be inquired into and addressed. The gross sins of church and state that these should be inquired into and addressed. Let me just say by way of a, an aside to those who may not be aware of the structure of presbytery or Presbyterianism, because I mentioned there the General Assembly, mentioning the General Assembly, I mentioned the presbytery. Just to be clear what they are, a presbytery consists of all the ministers within a, a designated geographical area, together with a ruling elder, one ruling elder for every minister, are represented in the presbytery. And this collective body of men is responsible for the oversight of such congregations, though congregations in a Presbyterian system have a measure of independence. No other congregations can interfere with them. But they are associated in a presbytery. Synods, they comprise all the members of every presbytery within a wider geographical area. Generally, they're a, they're a body or, or a court of review, but they will deal with things like appeals on disciplinary matters. Uh, 
The General Assembly is the highest court of, in a Presbyterian church, and it comprises a certain number. Often it was one minister in three of the whole denomination and an elder with them, uh, and they would be elected to the General Assembly by rotation, uh, in, uh, appointed by presbyteries to the General Assembly. Uh, that is the minister's uh, representative throughout the whole country um, with one elder for each minister appointed by presbyteries. That is the General Assembly. It is a representative body. It doesn't, it doesn't include all the ministers throughout the church, but just one in three, not the same men every year. There are checks and balances in the Presbyterian system from top to bottom. At least that's how it should be when it is working well. But the question here that came to the General Assembly through the overture of the Presbytery of Haddington uh, invited the church to look into the gross sins of the church and state. Uh, why? Why were they being asked to do this? Because of the spiritual peril facing the nation. That's what the Presbytery maintained. That's what Davidson maintained. But what could be proposed? Well, this is quoting from, from the overture. Of universal, this is what was repo, uh, proposed, of universal repentance and earnest turning to God and of order taking for resisting the enemies and maintenance of the liberties of religion and countries. The presbytery were convicted that were, there was little good in discussing means of resisting the country's enemies. Now this had to do specifically with the threat from Spain, which was threatening England. And the Scottish church was asked by the English to mandate um, uh, un underwriting or, or sending money to help uh, with uh, strengthening the army to resist Spain. And the presbytery were convinced that there was little good discussing the means of resisting the country's enemies without first giving attention to the relationship of the people to the king of kings and the lord of lords. The priority, for, the priority is, for people, is for people to be right with God. All else is really unimportant by comparison. So the proposal, the overture... The overture to the forthcoming assembly dealt first and foremost not with the structures of society or with poverty or any such thing or purported political or vi economic vices. So beloved of the modern church when it's making statements on all sorts of political and other issues. Not first and foremost, though there is an interest in these things, of course. But, with, but with, the, the interest was with, wait for it, first of all, the sins of ministers... Imagine that, the sins of ministers. Imagine taking a proposal to a General Assembly and dealing with the sins of ministers. We acknowledge, it said, our public transgressions of our persons and office, particularly whereof the catalogue is in readiness to be seen, lest it be found according to the saying of the Apostle that we that teach others teach not ourselves and so be found reprobates. But then the overture does address also the sins of princes, magistrates, nobility, and people in a way that was completely unflattering. A way that people certainly would not like today with all the sensitivity to just what people say. The purpose. What was the purpose of it? True amendment, true amendment, and for the provocation of the whole body to earnest repentance. This was not going to be a boring general assembly. But what would the ministers and elders make of this when they gathered for the assembly in the High Kirk of St Giles on the 24th of March, 1590, 1596? There were some good and godly men in the church Robert Bruce and Andrew Melville and people like that there were around 400 ministers and elders in all gathered and a challenge arose at the outset what place was going to be given to the overture presented by John Davidson on behalf of the Presbytery of Haddington now at that point I touched on this a little earlier just to clarify <clears throat> 
At that point, Brit Britain, not yet united, of course, England, was under threat from Spain, and the Scottish state authorities were looking for the approval of the Church to the levying of a tax to enable cooperation with England in order to resist the threat of Spain. Right? Wasn't that the chief purpose of the Assembly, to discuss how the Church would give support to the state authorities by, by agreeing to a tax to enable them to help out the English? See, the Scots can help out the English occasionally. They were asking for it and hoping for it. Wasn't that the chief purpose of the Assembly? Well, after discussion, it was agreed that the overture presented by the Minister of President Bans should be given due consideration. Quote, more important meantime than how the enemy might be resisted was the necessity for universal repentance and earnestly turning to God the best preparation against national disaster. So what did the Assembly do? The Assembly asked Davidson to expound the catalogue of perceived chief offences and corruptions in all estates. There were three estates um, in, in, um, in Scotland that governed, basically, um, and, and one of them was the nobles, the other were bishops, and the third were the borough commissioners. But that is another matter. But uh, the, the, what were the corruptions of these, the, these, these estates, the Kirk and the government, basically? Well, next day, Davidson presented the catalogue of offences in ministers. Um, it might be nice to pass this over. We don't want to speak ill of ministers, do we? Well, he did. He presented a catalogue of offences. Terrible was the indictment made before the assembly, we're told. No one was spared. We like to be spared, but no one was spared. From the king right down to his meanest, meanest of his subjects. We would not take this well. So be it. We would be deeply offended. So be it. But then... There was this profound conviction of the displeasure of the Lord and the slackness and downright corruptions of the church and society. And it was shocking for ministers to hear. First of all, for ministers, the, si the sins of, the sins of, uh, the sins of um, omission. The sins of omission. Negligence of ministers not giving themselves to their books and the study of the scriptures. Not giving themselves to sanctification and prayer. Not studying to be powerful and spiritual. Not applying the word to corruptions. Being too obscure and scholastic. Cold and wanting zeal. Lacking zeal. Negligent in visiting the sick or caring for the poor. Choosing parts of the word not relevant for the people. Flattering and dissembling public sins. Oh, how guilty the church is in this, these days. We might look and say, well, that's true of the mainline church, and it is these days, shockingly true. But search our own hearts. But then there are the sins of commission, the positive sins. One said of these, if only the meanest fraction were true, one can appreciate the anxiety of good men like Davidson to see something in the nature of amendment and revival. What were they? Light and wanton behaviour. As in gorgeous and light apparel and in speech. In other words, very fashionable. Being fashionable. Perhaps we should say overly casual. Light and profane company, unlawful gaming, dancing, card playing, etc. Swearers, profaners of the Sabbath, drunkards, fighters. It doesn't seem as though he could be speaking of ministers, does it? Lewd, flatterers, promise keep breakers, and so on and so on. Those found guilty of such things were to be duly disciplined. This is in the General Assembly. 
It was not a boring General Assembly, 1596. We might say, at this distance, and in our, um, and in our situation, refined situation, more refined we are, we might say, how does this apply to us? We evangelicals don't believe, won't, won't behave anything like that today. Ah, but we have to be careful. There's nothing new under the sun. We have tremendous technologies which can lead us down the path, uh, the garden path of sin. And, and maybe, among other things, real time wasters. We have the internet to contend with. The access to all sorts of deviant and corrupt morality and covetousness and acquisitiveness. These things are not morally or spiritually neutral. We might think to ourselves, well, uh, we don't watch it. I don't watch the television very much, but I usually watch the news. As if somehow watching the BBC news, you're watching something that's neutral. And you're not being got at in your mind. And it isn't affecting your soul to hear the news. Because it isn't neutral. It's loaded. It's loaded with, with influence along a liberal direction. I often, I often I, almost by principle, I don't watch the news these days. But when I see it or hear it, I think to myself, what are they trying to persuade me of to loosen my view, morally speaking. They're not neutral. The fact is, it is easy to be liberal, with a small L, I mean. Because what does the liberal believe? The liberal just believes in anything or nothing, as long as you're not too conservative. You, and that's an easy way. This is one of the reasons why people are not pressing into churches, because it's easy. They're liberal. They can go with the flow. It is a lazy, fair attitude to life. No restraints if you don't want them. And such a thing and such an atmosphere can be so, can be so, so debilitating to spiritual life. It clearly did then, though they didn't have the technologies that we do. Friends, our hearts can be a melting pot. Let's recognize it, a melting pot of de declension and sin even when all seems fair on the outside. But back to Davidson and the 1596 assembly. What was the result of all this straight, unchallenging talking? The matter came before the assembly a couple of days later, and the result was this. A day of humiliation. A day of humiliation. The ordinance that was passed was this, by the assembly. Concerning the defections in the ministry... The statement uh, being at length read out, reasoned and considered, the brethren concluded the same, agreeing therewith, and in, re in respect that by God's grace they intend reformation, and to see the Kirken ministry purged to the effect the work may have the better success. They think it necessary that this assembly be humbled for wanting such care as became in such points as are set down, and some zealous and godly brother in doctrine to lay them out for the better humiliation, their better humiliation, and that they make solemn promise before the majesty of God and make new covenant with him for a more careful and reverent discharge of their ministry, to the which effect was chosen Mr. John Davidson, and Tuesday next at nine o'clock in the morning, appointed in the Newkirk part of St. Giles Cathedral, Edinburgh, for that effect whereunto none is to resort but the ministry. This procedure was set on a Saturday for the following Tuesday. None of those who were entitled to be present were, were not, n none but those who were entitled to be present were admitted. The company consisted of 400 souls, all ministers or elders. So how did the service go? It began with prayer. And then there was the reading of Ezekiel, chapter 13, the watchman, uh, and, and chapter 34, whereupon Davidson delivered a sermon and exhortation. It was solemn, it was said. Now, you don't hear so much these days about solemn services. 
But this was a solemn one. People are more comfortable with joyful themes, with the user-friendly type of thing. Now, certainly, there is no joy like the Christian's joy. And in that wonderful period of revival of, what, of which we read in Nehemiah chapter 8, a wonderful, wonderful description there of, a, of a, a quickening of the Holy Spirit in, 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 in Jerusalem then. And the, there, was, there was joy to be found. There always is joy to be found. This is the other side of the solemnity. The joy of the Lord is your strength, they said. But there is a place to be humble before the Lord. It is not just Old Testament either. We have it in James chapter 4, 7 to 10, for instance. So what did Davidson urge? The purpose was confession of sin and promise of change. They were to enter a new covenant with the Lord. That is to say, new consecration to the Lord. That a spirit of repentance, that in a spirit of repentance, they might provoke others to follow their example. And the example given by a minister is a powerful thing. I think it was McChain that said uh, the, 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 um, um, the holiness of a minister is a powerful factor so far as the church is concerned. Davidson urges hearers to examine themselves. You don't hear much about self-examination either these days. But, you, but we need to... to, to, to remind ourselves of the need for self-examination searching our hearts concerning our state before God concerning our, our sanctification our relationship with God oh for the Lord to examine us for us to examine ourselves with honesty before him Apparently, he was very moving in his appeals. An hour into the service, Davidson saw clearly that his hearers were moved, and he exhorted to private meditation and confession with promise and purpose of amendment. But then a remarkable spirit fell upon the gathering. A sudden outburst of emotion overcame many. This was a meeting of ministers and elders, remember. For a quarter of an hour, just imagine it, a quarter of an hour, we quote, the building resounded with the sobbing of strong men. Sighs, sobs, shedding of tears, quote, so that the place might worthily have been called Bochim, for the like of that day was never seen in Scotland since the Reformation, as every man confessed. This was no emotionless day or formal exercise of humiliation or of far less business of a general assembly. And yet it was. This was the business of the general assembly. Here was a gathering humbled on account of confessed sin and lukewarmness. After public confession and prayer, Davidson continued... This was, con- this was concerned with action, with a determination on their part for consecration to the service of the gospel. Rising from their seats, there were 400 people there, rising from their seats, lifting up their right hands with one voice, they renewed their covenant with God. Quote, protesting to walk more warily in their ways and to be more diligent in their charges. The whole exercise, my dear friends, of humiliation, confession and determination to amendment was enjoined from the assembly upon the other church courts, upon the synods and the presbyteries and the congregations, And this seems to have been taken up with enthusiasm. This was a sure sign that the Lord had come amongst them and that there was a reviving work of the Holy Spirit. One historian was to say, this ordinance was obeyed 
with an alacrity and ardour which spread from synod to synod, from presbytery to presbytery, from parish to parish, the inhabitants of one city saying to another, Come and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. Until all Scotland, like Judah of old, rejoiced at the oath. What about the effects of this among the ministers and people? Church historian David Calder would just to say of the 1596, uh, that in 1596, that 1596 was a remarkable year in the life of the Scottish Kirk. We can believe that the repentance and confession expressed at the assembly had a transforming effect on the ministry of many and consequently upon the spiritual life of individuals and of congregations. Calderwood wrote that the Kirk was now come to her perfection and the greatest purity that ever she attained unto, both in doctrine and discipline, so that her beauty was admirable to foreign Kirks. The assemblies of the saints were never so glorious nor profitable to every one of the true members thereof than in the beginning of this year. Though the initial application of the 1596 overture was directed towards ministers, the call to self-examination, repentance, Confession and sanctification with the blessing of the Holy Spirit of the living God will surely transform our lives and our congregations and churches. Thus, this will not be just a great story from the past, but will be a personal call for the present as we are seriously exercised before the Lord. You ministers and pastors here, and you people who are under charge to bear them up before the Lord that they might be men full of the Holy Spirit and of power. Such was the revival of 1596. But just a a briefer word about the um, revival in Kirkushots in 1630. This related to a minister called John Livingston. Livingston was born in 1603 in Kilsyth in Stirlingshire, where his father was minister. John Livingston graduated from Glasgow University in 1521 and then studied in St Andrews. He was licensed to preach in 1625 and soon gained a reputation as a powerful preacher. But entry into the parish ministry was hindered through his opposition to the five articles of Perth in 1618, which was one of James VI's first ploys to encourage uh, an Episcopalianising of the Scottish Church. According to his autobiography, Livingston appears to have undergone a saving change while a young boy at school and to have communicated at Stirling while still at school. Quote, I had great cares about my salvation when I was but yet very young. Oh, you young people here, you have to have great cares about your salvation while you are young, that your life isn't whittered away by unprofitable things. It wasn't in the case of John Livingston, you see. I had no inclination to the ministry until a year or more after I had passed my course in the college. I thought I would spend a day alone before God, knowing of a secret cave. I thought it was made out to me that I behoved to preach Christ Jesus, which if I did not, I should have no assurance of salvation. Upon this, I laid aside all thoughts of France and medicine and land, the sort of professions that he had thought to follow through, and betook myself to the study of divinity. Invited along with the venerable Robert Bruce of Kinnear to preach at the Kirkushot's communion, In June 1630, as a 27-year-old probationer, a probationer incidentally is is a man who has been licensed to preach the gospel but hasn't yet been ordained into a particular congregation. Um, uh, The the communion in June 1630 in Kirkushots, um, to whom uh, uh, John Livingston, uh, it is said, to whom all doors to a settled ministry in Scotland appear closed, he was prevailed upon to preach on the Monday. Um, incidentally, uh, the peculiarity about the 
communion seasons in Scotland in the Reformed Church was preparatory services before the communion Sabbath and a Thanksgiving service afterwards. Um, this secured the Monday as the Thanksgiving day for communion seasons in Scotland for many, many generations and centuries. And indeed, the church of which I am a minister still has communion seasons with preparatory services before and the Thanksgiving service on the Monday. And it relates in a really direct way, perhaps slightly indirect way, to what happened that Monday in Kirkushots through the ministry of John Livingston. It hadn't been a usual custom, the Monday you see up till then, but such power and divine blessing had been experienced in that communion, Sabbath, that after a night spent in prayer, the large crowd of people could not disperse without praise and thanksgiving. Kirkushots, incidentally, if you're wondering where it is, it is in central Scotland, it is right in the centre of Scotland, it's 18 miles from Glasgow in the west and 30 miles from Edinburgh in the east. Well, Livingston records the occasion in his memoirs. The only day in all my life wherein I found most of the presence of God in preaching was on the Monday after the communion, preaching in the churchyard of Schott's. Churchyard. The night before, I had been with some Christians who spent the night in prayer and conference. When I was alone in the fields about eight or nine o'clock in the morning, before we were to go to sermon, there came such a misgiving of spirit upon me, considering my unworthiness and weakness, and the multitude and expectation of the people, that I was consulting with myself to have stolen away somewhere and declined that day's preaching. But I thought I durst not so far distrust God, and so went to sermon, and got good assistance about an hour and a half upon the points which I had meditated upon. They had great, they had great, uh, they had great uh, endurance in listening to sermons in those days. Then I will, sp it was from Ezekiel 35, 25, 20, th Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 and 26. Then I will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you. Ezekiel 36, 25 and 26. In the end, offering to close with some words of exhortation, I was led on about an hour's time. How long had he preached so far? An hour and a half. I was led on about an hour's time in a strain of exhortation and warning, with such liberty and melting of heart as I never had the like in public all my lifetime. It's hard for us, perhaps, just a picture of the scene, because everything is so brief these days. We have to be careful, of course, about the attention of people, our attentiveness, not be presumption, presumptuous. But it was recorded on this occasion, on that Monday of the communion in Kirkushots, that no less than 500 people ascribed their conversion under God to that sermon. It was a remarkable day of Messiah's power. And in remembrance of it, the Monday after a communion Sabbath was appointed to be observed in all congregations for the duty of public thanksgiving. As I mentioned earlier, um, one or two churches still doggedly hold on to a Monday thanksgiving service after a communion Sabbath. Uh, bearing in mind that you are maybe unfamiliar with the fact <laughs> and it may, it may be something of which you would scarcely approve that in general in congregations in our churches the communion is observed twice a year. Sometimes four times a year but twice a year normally. And the communion seasons begin on a Thursday with a focus on repentance. Friday with self-examination. Saturday with preparation. Communion Sabbath morning the Lord's Supper is observed and in the evening evangelistic service sermon is preached on the Monday Thanksgiving. Well, shortly afterwards, Livingston crossed to Ireland and became a minister at Kilinchy in County Down, 
but was deposed for non-conformity in 1632. In 1638, he returned to Scotland to support the Covenanters against Charles I and became Minister of Stranraer, Wigtonshire. He played his part in the tumultuous events that followed. In 1648, he became Minister in Ancrum, uh, that is in Roxburghshire in the borders, and in 1650 was one of those who negotiated the return of the exiled Charles II we have to say, as it were in brackets, being deceived along with others by the king's promises. In 1662 he was deposed and banished for refusing to take the oath of allegiance to the restored Charles II, the same Charles II. We'll touch on that later. He spent his exile in Rotterdam and died there full of faith and hope in August 1672. Let me just close with some general remarks about revival under the, under the suggestion, the need of the hour. Revivals are usually understood in terms of an unusual progress of the gospel in the hearts and lives of men, women and children at any given time. And it certainly must be that. It occurs in periods of unusual responsiveness of people to the things of God. And this was evident at various times in the Old and New Testaments. Think of the books of Chronicles. Think of Ezra and Nehemiah, the Acts of the Apostles. In Psalm 85, the psalmist cries, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? We read in Habakkuk, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known in wrath. Remember mercy. Thousands were saved at Pentecost when the Spirit came in power. Shortly afterwards, there was a great gathering at Samaria. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes, with one accord, heeded the things spoken by Philip. Perhaps one of the best definitions of revival has been given by William Hetherington, a free church divine, although this was in, before the disruption, this was in 1840, in Revivals of Religion. This is a book that was reprinted by the Banner of Truth, perhaps some years ago, I'm not sure if it's still in print. It comprised addresses from ministers who had been involved in notable awakenings in Scotland in 1839 and 40. And he said, When, therefore, men used to hear the term a revival of religion, it ought to be understood to mean an unusual manifestation of the power of the grace of God in convincing and converting careless sinners and in quickening and, in quickening and increasing the faith and piety of believers. Or, as he puts it another way, it is the life-giving, life-imparting, quickening, regenerating and sanctifying energy of the Holy Spirit, converting the hardened sinner and reclaiming the backsliding and dormant Christian. Or, as another put it, it is an unusual manifestation of the power of God's grace by enlivening the faith and godliness of God's children and by the conviction and conversion of indifferent sinners. Isn't this what we long for today? Now, revival will always impact on churches, principally and consequently, uh, pr principally in churches and consequently on public or social life. There is a close relationship usually between revival and reformation in the church. We can more safely say that reformation in the church presupposes a work of the Holy Spirit, what we might describe as revival, than say that revival will invariably be accompanied by reformation. But in true revival, a true work of the Spirit of God, there will be an infusion of spiritual life in the church. It will certainly impact on the church. And one would expect a powerful measure of gospel effectiveness and of reformation. The reason for that refers to, uh, relates to instrumentality. How does Christ use church ordinances in awaking dead or dying? Three things, three things uh, will be prominent in that context. First of all, the preaching of the word. There will be lively, spiritually searching preaching. It is by the foolishness of preaching that the Lord is pleased to awaken the dead and stir up the living. What sort of preaching? Preaching that stirs life, stirs lives and hearts and consciences of the hearers. What a difference it will make in the church. Dryness and dullness 
will be, will be dispelled. Instead, there will be seriousness and men and women will be exercised and will be truly God-fearing souls. But then there is prayer also. Invariably, there will be a quickening in the prayer life of Christians. We need a, pray, a quickening in our prayer life in these days. Formality and half-heartedness will not will not lead to such a work. Formality and half-heartedness will simply lead men and women becoming dull in the things of God rather than giving themselves to concerted prayer, prayer as a priority. Prayer is the key here. No doubt it was the key in 1596. No doubt that was true in 1630. No doubt it was true in 1839, 40 and 1859 as well. Prayer is the key in reformation and revival. Show me a people exercised in prayer, going earnestly and importunately to the throne of grace. There is a people who is serious about their own souls and surely the salvation of their fellows as well. Preaching, prayer but also scripture. The place and authority of scripture will figure instrumentally in informing and in instructing and in challenging the hearts of men and women and their lives. There will be a Berean spirit searching the scriptures, seeking its application, seeking uh, not to conform to the ethos uh, or the mores of the day, but the other way around. Here are people who stand on the word, who stand by the word, who read it, who hear it, who sing it, who meditate upon it, who apply it with the Holy Spirit from on high. You'll know something that is happening spiritually, my dear friends, in all your assemblies and gatherings and congregations. You know that something is happening spiritually when preaching, prayer and scripture stir us to a renewed piety and devotion to Christ and fill us with a zeal for God. Oh, that we would be filled with a zeal for God that is according to truth and knowledge. You know something that is happening spiritually in the churches when Christ and his word are once again accorded the authority, accorded authority, in all matters of faith and life. Let us pray for such a day. Let us pray for such an anointing of the Holy Spirit on our lives and on our churches and in our day. What can we say as we close by this? Lord Jesus, hasten such a day with us in our churches, in our land. Thank you.